Hello everyone and welcome Chryso to today's Cultural Institute Midri Salon event. A very good afternoon if you're joining us from the UK and a very good morning if you're joining us from the US. I'm Elaine Canning, Head of Special Projects at Swansea University and it's a huge pleasure to introduce you to today's event on editing the Harlem Renaissance, which is being led by esteemed speakers, Dr. Mariam Thaggart and Dr. Rachel Fairbrother. A huge welcome, Mariam and Rachel. So Mariam is Associate Professor of African American Literature at the State University of New York, Buffalo, and author of Images of Black Modernism, Verbal and Visual Strategies of the Harlem Renaissance. Mariam's new monograph, Riding Jane Crow, African American Women on the American Railroad, will be published by the University of Illinois Press next month. Rachel is Senior Lecturer in American Studies at Swansea University and author of The Collage Aesthetic in the Harlem Renaissance. And together, Mariam and Rachel have edited The History of the Harlem Renaissance, as well as African American Literature in Transition, 1920-30, published by Cambridge University Press and the subjects of today's salon. If you'd like to ask Mariam and Rachel any questions, please pop them into the Q&A facility during their conversation, and they will try and answer as many questions as they can towards the end of the session. And now, Rachel, I'm going to hand over to you. It gives me great pleasure to hand over to you to open today's conversation. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you very much, Elaine. And so it's it's my great pleasure to um, to speak with you today, and of course with Mariam. Um, we've been working on these two projects for many years um, together, and um, you know it's been an honour to work with Mariam and also to work with all the contributors um, who have shared you know their amazing work. So what we're going to do this afternoon is first of all. Um, we're going to give you just a little introduction to um, the two books, and then we're going to um, have a conversation between the two of us about some of the things in them. So I'm going to begin just by saying a little bit about the history of the Harlem Renaissance, and it's a volume that explores the unprecedented flowering of African-American cultural expression in the 1920s and 30s that we now call the Harlem Renaissance. It's, it, it looks at a very wide range of, of genres and, and forms. So we focus on um, the Romana clay, biography, dance, children's literature, and book illustrations. And what the volume really tries to do is to capture and analyze that range and, and, and scope. So it's very much inspired by the richness and variety of Harlem Renaissance expression, and um, it really seeks to think about the Harlem Renaissance now. You know, what, how does that speak to our contemporary moment? What does it, what does it mean now? And it, it finishes with um, an, an essay by Deborah E. McDowell, who is one of the key figures in the shaping of the Harlem Renaissance. And I think her work is particularly important for the way she has brought African-American women writers to um, the heart of what we now understand as the Harlem Renaissance. So it's a volume that sort of takes stock of the field and anticipates what's to come. So I'm going to hand over to Mariam now to say a little bit about African-American literature in transition. Thank you, Rachel. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the attack that took place in Buffalo, New York this past Saturday, May 14th. 13 people were injured, 10 people unfortunately passed. The violence of this past weekend inevitably led me to think about the violence that precipitated what we call the Harlem Renaissance. The summer of 1919 was a dangerous time for African Americans especially those, ironically enough, wearing the American military uniform. If you've been following the news in Buffalo, you know that the perpetrator of this horrific massacre was actually dressed as if he was part of the American army. Um, I'm gonna be talking just briefly about African-American literature in transition, 1920 to 1930. 
I remember when Joyce Lynn Moody uh, invited me to be a part of this really important 17 volume series um, covering African-American literature from about 1830 to the 21st century. Um, I remember being really challenged by the temporal markers, 1920 to 1930. Um, and I think this is something that both Rachel and I shared um, because I think both of us tend to think of the new Negro movement or the Harlem Renaissance in a kind of expansive temporal and geographic fashion. Um, so rather than just looking at the Harlem Renaissance as a period of the 1920s, um, I usually, and I, I'm not, I don't wanna speak for you too, Rachel, but I think generally as most, most scholars today think of the Harlem Renaissance, um, the new Negro movement as a much more um, expansive temporal experiment that wasn't just in the 1920s, but um, really um, some people argue that it even began in the late 19th century uh, and continues forward into the 1930s. So the temporal dynamics, the temporal um, endpoints of transition, I found very challenging. Uh, but fortunately, I had this great co-editor, Rachel Fairbrother, uh, who really, really is a remarkable editor, scholar, and writer. Um, and it was through our conversations that I was able to, I think we were both able to figure out um, what we wanted to highlight in this particular volume. Um, so we start off with this chronology, highlighting just some of the important events that took place in the 1920s, that one decade. Um, but I think as you go into the volume, you see that we try to um, raise unusual or uh, the issues that haven't generally been talked about um, with the new Negro movement. So we talk about very familiar authors that all of us are familiar with, like Langston Hughes or Neil Hurston. Um, but I think what we also try to do is bring in concepts that um, scholars are now more um, actively engaging when they talk about the new Negro movement. So say, for example, we have an essay on fashion and salons. Um, we also have an essay on recording the technology of the new Negro movement. Um, really fascinating essay by Adam McKibble on um, film um, and um, also an essay on um, some of the important essays, short essays that could usually be overlooked in uh, discussions of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, say for example, Zorn and Hurston's um, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. So um, I think the two books are very distinct. Um, I think history gives us a more expansive um, historical grounding in the period. And I like to think of transitions as the book that helps us expand conceptually um, what the period and the movement was like. Um, and so those are my introductory remarks on transition. Uh, but now I want to begin by asking Rachel the first question. Um, when we were, I'm sorry, I have to take off my glasses. I can't see too well. We'll have to read this. When we were working on the history of the Harlem Renaissance, someone asked us whether there was a need for another volume on the period. Um, what do you think these two books add to our discussion of the Harlem Renaissance? And um, what approach to Harlem Renaissance studies do you think the books were taking? I think um, there are a couple of things that are really interesting there. One, I, I, I think the fact that somebody asked that question um, really prompted both of us um, to kind of worry on the one hand, and also um, to really think about um, that question of the reception of the Harlem Renaissance, how um, it has this kind of double, um, double kind of place within the canon. On the one hand, you know, it is probably the period within, um, you know, a period within African American studies that has received a lot of attention. But on the other hand, there's a kind of um, suspicion of this period as well, partly because of the way it is um, often packaged up and associated with, you know, the jazz age, with partying, with things that are kind of um, not serious enough. And so I think that that question was one that really prompted both of us to kind of think um, quite quite hard, I think, and, and really challenged us. 
And I think the, um, in terms of what the two collections add, you know, I think there are all sorts of things um, that we could talk about here. Sorry, I've completely lost my thread there. Um, I don't know whether you want to help me out, Mario. Um, yeah, well, I think um, we definitely had a challenge. I think we both text, we both volumes. Um, and what's ironic and what most people may not realize is that history um, of the Harlem Renaissance actually started after we began on transition, but history was the was the first one of the two to be published. Um, and it, it was one of the challenges I think working on the volumes was, you know, how to, first of all, we kept getting some of the deadlines for each of the volumes mixed up. Uh, and we had to be clear on, um, you know, what we were doing with each volume. So we just, there was a challenge just trying to keep the two books distinct, I think, in our discussions and in our minds and in our uh, engagements with the contributors. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that I raised to Rachel and that we also put in, I think in the history book, um, someone had asked me, do we really need another book on the Harlem Renaissance? And actually this is a question that I got quite frequently um, by my grad school colleagues. Um, and I was surprised when I started getting it from my professional colleagues um, at my different institutions. And I think you're right that there is something about the Harlem Renaissance that doesn't seem to be as serious as other periods of African-American or American literary history. Um, I mean, I think, you know, when we consider all of the studies on the afterlife of slavery, um, when we think of other African-American literary genres like slave narratives, definitely the Harlem Renaissance has this perception of being the sort of party decade um, and I think that was something that we both wanted to challenge yeah. that perception of the Harlem Renaissance only as the jazz club. Um, the Harlem Renaissance is only about Langston Hughes and Hurston. Um, how do we find a way to introduce this very vibrant period of African American creative expression? How do we both introduce it to people who may be new to the period, as well as engage those scholars who have spent years studying this particular time period? So I think um, in addition to the sort of temporal challenges of, for me of thinking of the transition book 1920 to 1930, there was also the challenge of trying to maintain a balance between you know, introducing new people to this really important and fascinating uh, movement while also um, demonstrating to people that, yeah, we've had a hundred years of Harlem Renaissance and Harlem Renaissance studies, but there's still more to be mm -hmm. explored. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we had a fascinating um, email exchange about passing the, the new yeah. film. So um, could you tell, tell us what you thought about that particular film and um, how well you think that sort of um, adaptation was? So I think I think the um, the passing in itself, the, the novel is really interesting because it kind of keys into um, one of the kind of lenses that we wanted to kind of place. I think both of these studies in, and that is the absolute kind of centrality of black feminist scholarship and and also labour in bringing um, Larson's work kind of back to the center of the canon, you know, and I think um, this is a field that was completely transformed by the pioneering work of, um, of black feminist writers like um, Deborah E. McDowell, who we are absolutely delighted, was able to write one of our collections, um, Cheryl A. Wall. I mean, it's an enormously long list that um, I can't really do justice to, but that completely changed um, how people kind of saw um, the, the Harlem Renaissance. And it's something that we, we kind of trace within, actually in the introductions of both books, but in, 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 in slightly different, different ways. And what I think, I mean, there are many things that are very interesting about that film, but one of them is that it's very um, obvious, I think, that um, Rebecca Hall, who adapted um, 
the, the Noveland um, who um, directed the film was aware of that scholarship and it's very much drawing up, particularly on Deborah McDowell's mm -hmm. um, transformative reading of the novel in terms of it, um, it's, it's erotics, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want to add um, to that. I mean, it's a really interesting film, I think. Yeah, I, I thought it was, I was pleasantly surprised at how well the adaptation was. I, I was really skeptical. I, um, you know, when I hear that some of my favorite books are being made into movies, I just cringe. I just recently learned that um, Sula by Toni Morrison is going to be made into a film. Like, who's going to play Sula? <laughs> like, who, who's, what actress is strong enough to, to carry off that role? Yeah. But um, no, I thought the, the adaptation of Passing was really good. I, I was curious about the choice to do the film in black and white. I thought that was a great choice, actually, because it um, that sort of grayness that the connections between black and white. I mean, that's in one part one of the issues in passing the sort of biracial figure. Um, so I love the fact that it was in black and white, and um, they got rid of one of my favorite scenes in the novel, the, the scene with. Um, Gertrude Martin and Irene Kendry mm. and Claire, Irene and Claire. Um, but I thought they did a really good job of highlighting some of the minor figures in the book. Um, say, for example, um, Irene's maid, who really only gets like one sentence in the novel, but in the film really becomes a kind of pivotal secondary character who sort of welcomes Claire into this black world, you know, and you can sort of see her, the maid's um, annoyance mm. with Irene um, that we don't really get in the novel. So I thought that was a really great sort of translation um, of the novel. That was pretty yeah. good. Yeah. So, um, so what did you, I'm sorry, what did you think? We had a couple of interesting discussions about the, the images uh, that appear in the book. Uh, and we had a really long discussion about the image for the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, this was the first one to be published. And this has the image of Archibald Motley's um, black belt. Yes, thank you. You have it right on hand. That's, that. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what were some of your concerns about using that particular image for history? So, so I think there's a, there's, there are some really interesting issues that kind of come into play there, aren't there? I mean, one is that, as, um, as you've just said, one of the kind of aims that we had in the volume was to unsettle this kind of idea of the Harlem Renaissance being associated with, um, with kind of cabaret, with 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 jazz, with with party, and yeah, here we are with the, on the front cover, cover an image that to a certain extent um, kind of affirms that that link. Um, what's interesting is that probably in some ways the reason why that image is there is to do with as much to do with marketing as, right. as, as kind of anything else. Although I should say it's an image that um, you know I love. And I think the other the other thing that it raises that is another important question that we explore in the volumes is. Um, you know that this is an image of of Chicago, and um, you know that there is a question about um, how that term Harlem Renaissance works. Um, whether you know there's a huge debate that we explore within the volumes about um, whether that's a term that kind of narrows our perception of the period, or um, or, or or is it you know something that is a kind of well known well-known brand, if you like, that can be used as a, as a hook. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, definitely. And we wanted to, one, one good thing about the image is that it does highlight the fact that Chicago was um, another important geographic, geographical area um, for the new Negro movement. Um, and I think in transition, we also get a, a strong sense of how Washington, D.C., um, is a really important yeah. geographical center for that period. We have this really lovely essay by the scholar Shireen Sherard Johnson, um, 
in which she looks at the sort of salons in Washington, DC, organized by the poet Georgia Douglas Johnson. Um, she takes a look at a number of texts that I think have been overlooked in traditional studies of the new, new, new Negro movement. So we have the letters of Davy Carr, which was a serialized novel um, published in the 1920s. Very, there's been work on it. Um, and of course, one of our contributors edited the reissue um, of that particular novel. Um, but I thought particularly with um, that particular essay that begins transition, we encounter so many texts that I think um, even people familiar with the Renaissance mm -hmm. may not have studied or encountered. Um, Shireen Sherrod Johnson also takes a look at Jean Toomer's play. And of course now I can't remember the name of the play, but um, that just indicates the sort of new uh, text, the, the texts that haven't really been studied as much as some of the other mm. books and novels and poems in the Renaissance that illustrates how we try to incorporate um, this sort of overlooked text yeah. of that period. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think one of the, I mean, there are loads of things that are really interesting about that essay, that essay but one is this kind of sense that um, the kind of interior decor is, mm. is something fundamental to the, the debates about um, aesthetics and, and, and politics, and um, that it gives us another lens through which to kind of access that debate, because in this period there was a huge, a whole array of approaches to that question. You know, for some writers, um, they wanted to produce kind of almost art for art's sake, mm -hmm. and then at the other hand, you other end, you have, um, you know, really writers who see a very, very close link between politics and, and art. And um, I mean, I think what's very interesting about um, Shireen's essay is that it, it gives you that spectrum, um, you know, really complicates that, that binary. Mm -hmm. But I'm just gonna pick up a lovely question that's come in from Alan, um, which just because it relates to some of the things that we've just been saying. So, um, so Alan said, um, um, your suggestion that the jazz age is frivolous or somehow not serious made me wonder about the role of comedians and entertainers during this period. What was the role of comedy or satire in this period of African American culture? Hmm. That is a really that's a really good question. And I know Rachel, you actually have an essay in the transition volume in which you look at um, child dancers, or was it this one or was it another one? So Rachel did double duty, um, not only co-editing the volumes, but also contributing essays to both of them. Do you, do you know of any other comedians or sort of comic performers? I'm thinking of Ethel Waters, but she's, yeah. she's not really a comedian, but, yeah. um, but there was there's always something kind of humorous in yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think the comedy and, and, and kind of satire are really interesting modes in this period. One of the ironies, I think, is um, even as there's been this tendency to maybe frame the period um, you know, by, by focusing very much on kind of cabaret and ways that you know, lead to the sense of kind of diminishing it, what's quite interesting is that writers who were kind of um, using the kind of humorous or comic mode have had quite a mixed reception or, you know, so Rudolf Fischer, who I think both of us are, are real fans of, of his work. Um, he, you know, he, he wrote amazing short stories that are set in Harlem. He regarded himself as Harlem's chronicler and you know, every single piece of work that he, he wrote while amazingly also working as a doctor, um, all of them were set in Harlem. And they very much focus on sort of interracial tensions, um, but also they there is this sense also of um, kind of larger, you know, um, white encroachment. I think as well. But um, he he's he's a, he is a comic writer, mm -hmm. um, and and um, it's very interesting that he's been kind of slightly pushed to the margin. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other writer that springs to mind is is Skylar with. Um, um, black no more right yeah 
Um, yeah, Black No More. And then also <clears throat> his famous essay, Negro Art Hokum. Yeah. Um, and we just recently saw in the New York Times that there was a play. <laughs> Wait, not, not just a play. Was it a musical? It might yeah, have been musical. a musical. <laughs> uh, based upon George Schuyler's um, book, Black No More, which if you read the book, you can imagine how shocked <laughs> we both were yeah. to see that someone uh, yeah. adapted that book into a musical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think definitely Rudolph Fisher doesn't hasn't gotten his due. Um, and he's really one of the one of the best writers of the period and in terms of his humor, his descriptions of, yeah. of characters. I think um, yeah. And he was very prolific too, because he wrote he wrote two novels and many short stories. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think definitely he is a writer who more people should focus on yeah yeah, yeah definitely so um so I, w I wonder if um we might turn to the, the question of sort of a hundred years of studying the Harlem Renaissance what do you think we learn from the Harlem Renaissance in the 21st century I mean we kind of touched on this a little bit and what drives contemporary fascination with with the period you know I, I think that's a really important question I definitely one that we considered, uh, especially with the history volume. Um, you know, I think we've seen by looking at the Harlem Renaissance and the Harlem Renaissance scholarship, um, I think we see so many um, elements of African-American literary scholarship um, appear in the study of the Harlem Renaissance. So say, for example, the whole discussion about the recovery of Black women writers. I mean, really, it's Alice Walker's essay in which she sought out um, Zora Neale Hurston's grave. I mean, a, a, number of, a number of scholars identify uh, Walker and that essay, um, In Search of Our Mother's Garden, um, as the sort of uh, initiating moment mm -hmm. of that recovery, and I, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about the term recovery, yeah. but um, the sort of recovery of women writers of the 1920s. And, um, you know, if we look at that Walker essay and then just what happens um, throughout the late 1970s, the 1980s and the early 1990s, um, how much of African-American literary scholarship was dependent upon um, investigating, analyzing, close reading the works of people like Hurston and Larson. A little bit of Fawcett, though I think Fawcett gets a little yeah. bit, um, Fawcett for some reason isn't as um, respected, I guess, in some yeah. ways, but um, definitely how Hurston specifically sort of generated a really wide expanse of scholarship on um, African-American literature, African-American women's literature, feminist literature, womanist literature. I mean, really sort of um, as Hazel Carby, I think very famously, was it Hazel Carby or it might've been Anne Ducille, yeah. talked about Hurston as a sort of um, industry, a publishing industry that um, enabled uh, a number of essays and other works. And still to this day doing so because most recently, one of our contributors, um, Genevieve West, just published a book with Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, of course, in the yeah, yeah. So it's the essays, isn't it? Right, it's a collection of essays. Yeah. Um, you don't know us Negroes, maybe? Is yeah. that the title? Yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's a collection of essays um, by Hurston. And then of course, we have the recent, a couple of years ago, the reissue of Barracoon, yeah. um, Hurston's unpublished novel. Um, so I think Harlem Renaissance studies, it's a, you know, we have a hundred years of it, but I think we're going to continue to investigate that period because so many of the, the questions and debates that appear in that period are reappearing now. Yeah. And I began with this idea of, of, of violence, um, the violence this past weekend and the violence of 1919. And I, I think that's just one example um, but I think also the question of um, Black feminist scholarship um, still 
continues to engage with that period. Most recently, there's Autumn Womack's um, book yeah. that came out. Um, I can. I'm bad with titles. I'm bad with names. But um, it's getting really good reviews. Yeah. Um, I've gotten a copy. I haven't started reading it yet. Yeah. Me too. I haven't read it yet. Either, but, yeah. yeah. So um, I think it's still going to be investigated. Yeah. 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 I think I think the um, these kind of re re remarkable kind of recoveries of lost or unpublished work are really interesting, and in that they very much speak to. I think what we do in the African American literature in transition book, um, because in many ways, what that whole series is about is a kind of reimagining of what literary history mm -hmm. might be. And I think it, it really is, I mean, it's a really, really important, um, you know, that the volume that we've done is kind of placed alongside all of all of the others and the kind of dialogues that go on between the different volumes so that on the one hand, it's a volume that seeks to use concepts of kind of transition and change as an alternative way of kind of telling literary history. So, you know, focusing on technology or on migration or on changing concepts of fashion. But on the other, it's, it's also kind of stretching that concept of transition to think about, well, how is this writing from the 1920s in conversation with, uh, with earlier works and later work. So it's a kind of transtemporal um, kind of approach as well as being a kind of um, delimited mm -hmm. one. Um, and I think that was something that it took us both a while to kind of get, get to grips with. But mm -hmm. once you do, it's a really um, kind of fruitful way of kind of thinking about um, how you might do literary history. You know, so um, just thinking about, say, the, the passing narrative you know, we were thinking about 1920s versions of, of, of kind of racial passing narratives, but putting that into conversation with, with later texts and really thinking about the kind of afterlives, if you like, of um, the Harlem Renaissance in African-American literature, film, visual art. Um, so, you know, passing has, has kind of spawned, you know, so many kind of texts that are in conversation with it. Um, you know, just to pick a few random ones, there's a wonderful um, graphic novel by um, Matt Johnson and Warren Police called Incom Negro, which um, amalgamates the genres of the passing novel and detective fiction with, with graphic fiction. And one of our contributors to um, History of the Harlem Renaissance, Sinead Moynihan, has a wonderful essay on, on that. Um, so, so those kind of dialogues are really, really interesting, mm -hmm. I think, as well, as well. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want to ask another question. Um, one thing I was curious about, you know, I'm, I'm an American, I'm African-American. I have a certain, I had a certain understanding of the New Negro movement. Um, I was curious, like, what drew you to the Harlem Renaissance? And, um it, it, it's really fascinating to me to see so many of our contributors came from the UK. And it was interesting to see um, how the Harlem Renaissance has been uh, studied, how it's uh, understood uh, across the Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about how you got started interested in the Harlem Renaissance and like yeah. what drew you to the period? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's this really interesting question, isn't there, about how the field gets kind of um, framed in different ways and different contexts. Um, and I know this is something that um, my colleague Daniel Williams, has, you know, has, work, has done brilliant work on thinking about the connections between Wales and um, kind of African American writing. Um, and, and I think there really is this sense that there are different, you know, um, I suppose different writers kind of come to the fore. So you might think about, you know, Paul Robeson in, in, in Wales, for instance. Um, but I guess, I mean, I, I interestingly came, um, you know, came to this work really through, um, through reading, um, first of all, um, Tony Morrison and, and Alice Walker, and then um, a bit, well, not, you know, kind of following, I suppose, the path set by Alice Walker, of, of kind of tracing artistic form members. And that's really how I entered into it. So I think that really speaks yet again 
to just how pivotal um, back then that scholarship has, has been to kind of how we see the Harlem Renaissance. There's a wonderful essay by um, Cheryl A. Wall called Engendering the, um, the Harlem Renaissance. And I think, you know, that, that approach has kind of been key. And, and I wanna ask you another question. And this, this is a question we haven't discussed before but it's sort of based upon my own sort of per perception. Um, do you think that one of the reasons why the Harlem Renaissance isn't as respected, quote unquote, if we want to use that term, is because of the number of Black women who study it or the number of Black women who have furthered the, the study of the period? I mean, I, I I sort of wonder, like, just as the Harlem Renaissance as a literary field was being discussed more, it, it occurred at the same time as this sort of Renaissance and Black women's writing. And so many of our really significant Black female scholars, Deborah McDowell, Cheryl Wall, Mary Helen Washington, Mary Emma Graham, like so many have done work on the period. And so I'm wondering, like part of me wonders if the, the presence of black female scholarship, the richness of it, if there's some element of sexism in the, in the discussion of the Renaissance as not being as serious mm -hmm. as a period. Yeah. That, that's just my, it, it's, um, I mean, I haven't fully fleshed it out. It's just something I've always had in the back of my mind. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that raises a, a really important question, doesn't it? And I think um, there's a, a really interesting um, edited collection that came out a couple of years ago called Editing the Harlem Renaissance, which like, stole, stole in their title. <laughs> but there was one of the things that really struck me in reading that collection was the emphasis on the kind of labor of, mm -hmm. Um, you know, of, of bringing works back into print and actually then questions about what kind of gets archived, which, which writers, um, you know, are the ones where, you know, I don't know, the big American universities are kind of saving their archive or somebody is, is saving the archive and what difficulties are then created when um, that archive's not available. And I think that that's another kind of really, really important question about, you know, say the question of editing and Nella Larson's passing is, you know, the question of the ending. There are actually two different versions of the book and the very, it's, you know, the final lines. And we have really no way of knowing which, which one to choose. So there's this kind of fundamental uncertainty there um, that, I think is really, really, really important, you know. Um, I mean, it, it kind of adds to the novel in many ways because the whole of the novel is about kind of uncertainty, but mm -hmm. it does also raise questions about who decides, you know, kind of what's valuable to kind of, um, you know, preserve, archive, collect um, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and this raises another interesting point about Larson, <clears throat> and I want to go on record here, um, that I think at some point we're going to find Nella Larson's third novel, Mirage. It's out there. Someone has it. It's in someone's attic. It's in some institution's archive, mislabeled, misshelled. Um, it's out there somewhere. And um, hopefully at some point we can find it. Um, do we want to open it up to more Q&A. Yeah, oh, we've got a couple of questions here so that I will just read out. So one is from Claire. So thank you very much for coming, Claire. Um, do you think that the perceived lack of seriousness within Harlem Renaissance literature has anything to do with the role that often white patrons played in the careers of particular writers? Is the role of patronage explored in your books? That's a really good question. Yeah, definitely. And of course, um, the question makes me think of Carlin Beckton and his very um, 
integral role in promoting some of the writers of the Renaissance as well as collecting um, the papers and the manuscripts mm -hmm. of so many of the period. And yeah, I think definitely someone like a Sterling Brown, who was a poet of the period and a professor at Howard University, highly critical of the term Harlem Renaissance, mm -hmm. really disliked that term and also really disliked the role that Carl Van Becken played in the period, uh, precisely as um, Claire's question suggests that um, white patronage um, in, some, in, in some cases influenced uh, what, or at least influenced the work of some of the period like Langston Hughes and Charlotte Oscar, yeah. Charlotte Oscar Mason. And of course there was a really, um, Hughes has written very poignantly about sort of breaking up with that particular patron. But yeah, I think that's another reason why that period is looked at with some skepticism. Yeah. Um, especially if we think about other African-American literary periods in which um, self-affirmation, autonomy was really important. So like the Black Arts Movement, right? Where right. Um, you actually have some of the writers of that period being very critical of the writers of the 1920s. Yeah. And I think there are a couple of things that are very interesting about that. One is that the way that um, some writers in the Black Arts Movement look back on the Harlem Renaissance is also to, you know, to do with a kind of quite masculinist um, and, and, to, and, um, and to some extent a homophobic view as well. Um, mm -hmm. But kind of what seeks to erase the kind of queerness of Harlem Renaissance expression. Um, but to sort of just add a few more things in response to Claire's um, question is, but we've got uh, one chapter that does really trace kind of interracial relationships um, and it, that they're kind of shaping influence on the Harlem Renaissance in the, um, the history volume that really offers quite complicated view of that. Um, and that's by um, Kathleen Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. The other, the other um, kind of angle that I think um, that is also explored that maybe hasn't been touched on that much is an essay that we've got by um, Adam McKibble mm -hmm. that thinks about the rise of what, um, the, the kind of importance of also acknowledging um, the, a kind, the, the way in which white supremacy was dealt with and responded to um, within Harlem Renaissance writers. So he looks at um, um, Cohen, a writer um, he published in the Saturday Evening Post, which was you know, one of the most um, widely read magazines at the time. And basically these were short stories that um, breathed new life really into minstrelsy, mm -hmm. but they, they kind of repurpose it for the modern age. Um, thinking, you know, relating it to modernity, you've got, you know, aeroplanes, you've got cinema all in there. And I, I think it's really important that that, that you know, that's kind of explored um, as well. So we've also got a question from Roberta. So thank you very much. Um, does your methodology on transitions apply to time and history or to gender and sexuality too? I'm thinking also, of the centrality of black, black feminists to the trans and queer queer movement. So that's another really good question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do you want do you want to answer that, Marin? Well, shall I start off this time? Um, hmm. I'm trying to think. I I think definitely one of the authors that is getting more attention now is Richard Bruce Nugent. Yeah. Um, he wrote this really powerful short story, Smoke, Lilies, and Jade, um, as well as a, a novel that was published after his death. Um, and he was a, um, I think he was bisexual. Um, and I think there, there were a number of really good works being done on um, not only his literature, but also his artwork. He was also an artist. Um, and I'm trying to, yeah, I think. Yeah, 
I mean, there, there's also, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go. Oh, I was just going to mention the, the films, um, um, Looking for Lampston, yeah. and there's another one. Brother, I, brother, isn't it? Brother to brother. Oh, um, right. Yeah, right. I think, I think actually Roberta's question is really interesting because um, where, where you speak both about time and history and gender and sexuality, there's, a, there's this wonderful essay, um, I think it's by, I can't remember what her first name is, um, Lo Dorothea Loberman, mm -hmm. um, where she talks about concepts of touch um, and, and queer touch, and she thinks about Nugent. So Nugent's very interesting because a lot of his work, well, his novel was not published during his lifetime, but it's another of these recovered texts that was published I don't, can't remember the date, but quite late, you know, in, in the 2000s. And she kind of uses this idea of touch to talk about how um, there, are, there are these links that can be made between the writing that emerges are kind of in the early 20th century and, um, you know, readers, thinkers in the two th you know, 2000s. And it's that kind of sense of the ephemeral that she's really, really interested in. Um, and I think that's one of the things that the volume al also tries to do is thinking about literary history, not just in terms of the concrete, but also in terms of feeling, touch, um, um, you know, sound, things that you can't, that aren't so tangible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope that, I, there's a lot more to kind of unpack, I think, in answering that, that question, but, but the, I think that those things are all um, kind of in the mix, thinking about transition, um, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then we've got another um, question, and this one I think is definitely one for Mariam, who has a wonderful, wonderful essay on Claudia Rankin in dialogue with the Harlem Renaissance. So um, could you reflect on whether the contemporary work of Claudia Rankin is in dialogue with Harlem Renaissance writing? Oh, right. definitely. Yeah. Um, and Rachel's right. I have an essay looking at Claudia Rankin's book, Citizen and American Lyric, um, that came out in 2014. Um, and I was really interested in the images in that particular book. So um, at one point in the book, there is a painting, a replication of a reproduction of a painting by Glenn Ligon, um, who takes the quotes from two um, two paragraphs from a Hurston essay, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. Um, and I was just struck at, at how the painting really sort of um, raised for me some of the issues dealing with language and image that I see working during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and I was just drawn to that particular, uh, those particular paintings in Citizen trying to look at how both the, the images by Ligon and Rankin's writings um, highlight sort of the difficulty of trying to express a sort of black modernism. Like how do you, how do you picture it? How do you view it? How do you express it? Um, and I, I think both Rankin and Ligon do a really beautiful yeah. job of talking about are showing how different forms of racial trauma uh, impacts um, the subject's language and expression. Um, and I, I make a link between Ligon's sort of blurring the words in his painting uh, to the sort of um, rupture of the binary word and image uh, that I think Black modernism tries to uh, uh, tries to entangle. Yeah, no, it's a, a brilliant essay, which I highly recommend. It's in um, um, the, a new volume, um, the new modernism. New modernism. So yeah, by, uh, um, edited uh, by Douglas Doug Mao. Yeah, so definitely check that out. And um, so I think we're going to round things to a close there. Um, so thank you to all of you. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone in, that did ask a question. I think I've, I've done them all. Thank you so much for coming today and for listening. Um, thank you so much to my brilliant collaborator um, and, and uh, great friend, Marian. 
Uh, and yes, and I have to give a great thanks to Rachel, who's a very great editor, as I mentioned. Also, we should thank um, Joyce Lynn Moody and yeah. Cassandra Smith. Um, these are the um, series editors of Transition, the Transition in African American Literature series. Um, also, a thank you to Ray Ryan, who is the editor at Cambridge University Press, who uh, invited us to be part of this project. Um, and then also thank you to all of our many contributors yeah. uh, who've been extremely patient uh, and extremely generous with their time. Oh, sorry, I've missed the question. Oh dear. Thank you very much for letting me know. Let's have a look. So how did you come together to edit these volumes? And how did you divide the, car the, the task? These are really important questions. How <laughs> did the pandemic affect the process of, um, of, of our progress to completion? So, um, well, so we, met, we met at a conference. We met at a Modernist Studies Association conference. I think it was in Las Vegas. Yeah, was no, yeah it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and um, I was invited to do literature in transition. And I asked Rachel to do an essay and she agreed. Um, and I was also asked to do history and it was just too much. It, there's, it was just so much work. And um, I asked Rachel to come aboard as a co-editor and it was a wonderful decision. She is such a key editor. I think, I think you missed your colleague as some sort of um, journal editor or, book editor um but yeah that's how we that's how we came together yeah see that's the, the nice way of framing it the other way is to see see me as a, an obsessive <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, it is definitely that and um and I suppose most of the work for the volumes was kind of completed and um, for transition I yeah. think most of it was completed um when you came on as co-editor but as I mentioned, it was really important and extremely helpful to have to be in dialogue with someone else to make certain editorial decisions. Um, and I, I think one of the most important decisions I, I want to put this on record was you convinced me not to start off our <clears throat> the introduction, I think, to history with that question of do we need another book on the Harlem Renaissance? So Rachel very um, gently and very diplomatically suggested that it's probably not good to start off a volume with such a negative question. So, um, you know, that was just one of her many pearls of wisdom. <laughs> okay, right. Thanks ever so much, everyone. Um, I think that kind of brings us to, to a close. So thank you for your time. Right, well, thank you. And it's so good to see you again, Rachel. Thank you.